if you had to choose between keeping all your toys or keeping your TV set, which one would you choose? The TV set. TV. TV. If you had your friends or give up your TV? My friends forever. My friends. If you had to choose, would you rather give up watching TV forever or talking to your father forever? Talking to my dad. Pretend you don't know who this is. Who is this? This is NBC Nightly News. The energy future will not be pleasant for you or for me or for other Americans. You're going to get it, Raj. Why don't you shut your face? <laughs> now, don't you talk to your sister like that. Yeah, don't talk to me like that. Why don't you shut your face? <laughs> In most American homes, the television set is on more than five hours a day. It entertains us, informs us, sells us. Since we watch it so much, we think we know all about it and take it for granted. Most of us can't imagine what life would be like without it. A Minneapolis television station decided to find out. WCCO-TV called families in the area and offered each of them $500 to give up television for a month. More than half refused. Of those who finally agreed to try, all were heavy television users. At the start of the experiment, a TV repairman was sent to each house to disconnect every set. WCCO's cameras were there. This is gonna hurt. Oh, boy. Where should we go now, Moth? <laughs> In the summertime, it'd be easy. It'd be a That's what you get. But I got a feeling it's gonna be a long 30 days. A long 30 days. It makes me nervous. It does, it really makes me nervous to know that I can't go turn on my set and sit down and watch TV. It's really nerve-wracking. Well, the first week was bad, you know, because the kids are used to it and everything, but now I don't think it's gonna be beyond that much. I'll be thankful to have it back, I'm sure. <laughs> Very thankful. Um, well, then again, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll get used to it and find other things to occupy my time. That could be, too. You never know. I don't think the chances are very good, but... <laughs> We've been, uh... Yeah! Bored enough at times where we actually went over to our mother-in-law's house and got some old catalogs, you know, Christmas catalogs or something, just to sit around here and go through looking at the catalogs for Christmas stuff, you, you know, just for something to do. It's, it's getting hard to find any more stuff to do. Scott, my nine-year-old, just the other day said, uh, I suppose when we get hook up the TV again, we won't be playing games like this anymore because we didn't do much of it before. The two-year-old, you know, he, two and a half-year-old Daniel, he, uh, he just loved to play trucks, Dad, you know? Never asked me before. For some families, living without television meant more time together. Then you stop and say hi to me, okay? Here we go. Hi, mister. For most, however, the long month without TV took its toll. It was awful. <laughs> it was, and I, I would never do it again. With the month finally over for the families in Minneapolis, television returned. None of the families could have predicted the impact of living without it. Why? What is it about the way we watch television that makes it so hard to give it up? You know, television, like Water for the Fish, has become an environment rather than a, a series of individual program choices and acts. And people say, you know, they watch television they, rather than specific programs sometimes. And when they say people get what they want, it's a lie, really, because you know, they get what they get. You know, they want television and they get whatever somebody decides to put on it. And if you took all of the stuff off television now that's on and put something else on, either worse or better, they would watch that because that's what they get on television. Television has become something all of us share, whether we realize it or not. It reaches us wherever we live. Few communities
families in this country can say television doesn't affect them. Until recently, one such place was the tiny desert town of Essex, California. The high mountains of the Mojave Desert prevented a TV signal from reaching Essex, so the people there did pretty much the same things people did everywhere before television. They met at the post office, read newspapers when they could get them, visited with each other, and found their own entertainment. But that's all changed now. A cable TV company donated a special tower to relay a signal from Phoenix. The familiar TV antenna rose from every roof, and people plugged in their sets. The age of television had come to Essex. The effect was immediate. Uh, Santa Fe used to come by and drop papers off at the crossing there. I turned out they just throw a bundle of papers off for everybody that wanted them. They'd bring them out from San Bernardino. But uh, after the advent of TV, they quit doing that because we got all we needed. And a lot of times they'd forget we'd get a paper a day or two late, and who uh, needs old news? What if Russia decided to bomb us and our TVs weren't on out here? Well, this whole country could blow up before we'd know it. The kids, every Saturday morning, the first thing they do is watch that all them cartoons, and in fact, sometimes I sit there 15, 20 minutes watching them myself. <laughs> I love to read, but uh, when my soap operas are on, I, I glance through a book, but I can't actually get absorbed in it because I have an ear always to the TV. If you're lonesome, well, you can turn the TV on. It's like somebody in your house. Well, my daughter Gloria knows the commercials by heart. She can hum most of them. She uh, sings most of them to a year. I can tell you just anything that comes on right away, we can tell you what the commercial is without even looking at it. Thing. The influence is there. There's no, there's no doubt about it. So what do we do? We watch uh, TV about the time you get up, or the time you go to bed at night, to step with uh, everything that's going on in the world. Now people in Essex see the same programs, watch the same news, laugh at the same jokes as everyone else in the country. An endless array of television images competes with their own small town culture. Television shows them lives very different from their own. They sure got a lot of sex. <laughs> I don't know, they're always kissing somebody's neighbor and we don't do that around here. We don't even shake hands. We say hello, but no, it's, it's, they're different. Everything about the lives of them people are so unreal compared to what we have out here. It's just, it seems fantastic that anybody can live and do the things that them people do. Well, there's a, one program that chips that Eric Estrada and the, the young gals kind of go a little bit crazy over him. I guess he's a pretty good star, and I've watched chips. It's a, it's a good program. I don't think they could uh, make CHIPS number one TV program that they have if they showed it the way it was in real life. Because you're watching a program where they have to get everything into it within a specified time. And they're trying to sell it to the public. If the people in Essex are sold on television, it's more than just the cop shows or the sitcoms or the soap operas. Beyond the mountains in every direction is a world worth knowing about television connects them to it and makes them a part of it. This gives us another dimension to our lives. Uh, news coverage is great. It's the only way you know what's going on outside, away from here, is through the, the world news. I think it have a big war somewhere, and we wouldn't know it if we wasn't, didn't have the TV to see what's, going, what's really going on. Long-range Israeli artillery. Sending shell after shell into southern Lebanon. This was the fourth straight day of fighting. It began Sunday with a Palestinian guerrilla attack on an Israeli coastal town. Television news is very, very good at what we call the transmission of experience. We can show you a, a politician with tears in his eyes when he's lost a race. We can show you a war. Uh, we can show you um, a flood or a hurricane in ways that newspapers and magazines cannot do. Where television falls short is in the transmission of fact. TV news is considered by many people to be an illustrated headline service, which is just fine. Many people rely on television news. It's important, however, to compare TV news to print news. 
it's important to look at the objectivity in television news, to discuss why certain stories are selected, to consider the depth and length of reporting, to consider the structure of a news program or a news report. We put stories uh, at the beginning of the program very often because we think they're important news, but also because they um, have very strong visual impact. We are a visual medium. We're very good at sending pictures through the air. The staff decided that Babcock and Wilcox nuclear plants should be shut down. Mr. Carter's visit to New Hampshire is the unofficial start of his 1980 primary campaign here. The bomb exploded in the center of Salisbury's business district. After brushing Florida's east coast for hours, Hurricane David finally came ashore this afternoon. When you think that on a winter's evening, about something on the order of 50 million Americans watch one of the three network television news programs in a country our size, that, that is a powerful medium. Television is the massest of the mass media. I mean, we have no other medium to compare it to. If you hit uh, and reach let's say 10 million homes in America, which is a vast number of homes, uh, that would be considered a failure in commercial television today. And the ratings would not be high enough and you'd be dropped. In television, you have to consistently have an audience of 20 million people. Now, what happens in, in those circumstances, especially when you're dealing in limited formats, 30 and 60 minutes, is that you have to make everything very simple. The, the laughs have to come easily. They have to come from stereotypical situations. Uh, you deal in simplicity as opposed to complexity. So there's a, there's a constant watering down process that goes on in most of television. What happens, you are faced with, uh, once you take commercials and opening and closing credits and so forth, maybe 22 minutes of show. It is very difficult, very difficult to truly explore a problem uh, within 22 minutes. You also don't have the time uh, to really show character development. Uh, and within the hour format, you don't either. Uh, a a uh, adventure show or a, uh, any one of the shows on the air. And therefore, you collapse or condense what would be maybe the nice moments. So the TV shows produced on Hollywood sound stages like these must keep their conflicts simple and resolve them quickly. For the people who watch those shows, the question becomes, what's entertainment and what's reality? People assume that there's a 30-minute resolution to problem solving, that, or an hour, that you can solve it in an hour, you can solve it in 30 minutes, and of course, we know that isn't true. Yes, I'm calling from the trip. I'd like to complain. On some shows, the characters try to deal more realistically with serious issues and how they get resolved. One of those shows is Lou Grant. All truth is limited on TV and certainly Lou Grant's truth. But at least we, we try to get a, a little more in the tank than the average show. Come on in. I think you should hear this. I know. It's gotten into it. His mother's real sick leukemia. We've both seen her. Um, we think she's, she's dying, right? I have a hard time with that word. Yeah. I think she's dying. Shows a lot about feelings. Characters get hurt a lot on the show. They're very frustrated and often very unfulfilled. And, uh, and when they are satisfied or happy, it doesn't last that long, which is like life. That's a wonderful thing about the Lou Grant show. It shows, I think, real people stumbling, falling, getting up again, brushing themselves up, trying. I had to fight rush hour traffic to get back here from Inglewood, and I had 15 minutes to write it. It shows, doesn't it? I will get you for this. Now let's talk about that. Why do you suppose you're so thin-skinned about criticism? The days will pass, we'll go our separate ways, you'll drop your guard, and I will get you. Why are you lowering... One of the purposes of programming on television is to provide advertisers with the largest possible audience for their commercials. For the advertiser, the making of the commercial is as important as the making of the show. This commercial is about the danger of not having insurance. Okay, now you got to hit them right on the head. Are you worried about hitting them? Don't worry. Walk them one. Okay, right when he gets hit, someone goes hit, you let him go brrrr, shake him, thump, 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 right out of frame. And you just keep looking at the camera like that, going down. Okay? 
You know, let's just practice. You got a rock up there? Action. One, two... In many ways, commercials are just like programs. There's a story to tell, a conflict to resolve, all in 30 or 60 seconds. <laughs> okay, let's put a little bug juice in here. At the country companies, we know most people are sometimes too busy to think about insurance. Uh, I'll get to it eventually. But yet, nearly every reason for not thinking about insurance is the very reason you should. There is a kind of television without commercials, public television, where the purpose of the programming is different. My guess is the public television educates more. That's a dangerous phrase to use because it makes it sound like public television is something that's good for you to watch, like the bad tasting medicine. Um, and the fact that public television has gotten so much better and has so much that is entertaining, which does not mean it isn't educational. Um, I, I think it, it, it does a wonderful job of bringing people quality things that are also very, very enjoyable to watch. <laughs> I'm Bill Moyers. On any one day in this country, there are about 15,000 women serving time in jail. Many come from broken homes. Most started on crime when they were young, and over half are mothers. Mothers whose children are likely one day to follow them into crime and jail. My grandmother was wondering, too, if the Robesons came from North Carolina, because the Robesons had a plantation there. And I said, Dean Robeson, my father didn't just come from North Carolina, he escaped from North Carolina. <laughs> we needed you. The Negro people need the great ones like you. We owe a place to those who come after us. We owe them a place. Will I be the next ex-nigger of the year? No! They'll not do that to me. I'll be found staggering to Harlem, chasing a ghost of what I might have been. They'll not do that to me. Television has become an intimate part of our lives. Its content affects us. So does the sheer weight of the hours we watch. What we watch and how we watch it influence the way we act and the way we think. If you had to choose, would you rather give up watching TV forever or talking to your father forever? Hard. My dad. Is it uh, Monte Carlo? Is it Monte Carlo? <laughs> No, I just heard everything right now. Is it snake eyes? Are you sure? Oh, no. No, sir, there's work to be done. Oh, all right. 